thank you so much, Karen. Um, for anyone that doesn't know this, I found out earlier today that Karen has been doing these every single day, multiple times a day without a break and a day off. So thank you so much for your dedication, Karen. You are incredible as well as everybody over at the center for offering just so much really great quality PD and it's a pleasure to be part of it. So um, my name is Rachel Giannini and I am an early childhood educator, an advocate and a video blog host. I taught preschool for about seven years my final year in the classroom, a documentary crew came by and decided that they were going to um, film us every single day for eight weeks. And what resulted was the film No Small Matter. Perhaps you've seen it. Um, shameless plug. I know. I had no Small Matter. Um, after the film wrapped, I started working at the Chicago Children's Museum while I was getting my master's. And when I was there, I started realizing um, how important media is and videos and the museum was having me make content that was basically pulling the museum experience into the home. And as I got more and more comfortable with vid video, it became my full time job. Well, let's cut to what is currently going on. When the pandemic hit, there was a big part of me. I mean, you guys are all the same. We're all like completely selfless people who just want to make things right. And I'm sure like many of you, I was trying to figure out what I could do to be helpful. What I, how can I be the most helpful person I can be in this time? And I was looking around online and I noticed that there's a lot of parents who really had not a lot of ideas about what to do with their children, especially not to do what to do with their children for eight hours all day long. And then it kind of hit me. Well, I know a whole lot about early ed and I know a whole lot about making films. So let's go ahead and make a series. So the series is called um, Quarantine with Rachel. And the whole idea is that every single day there's an under two minute video that allows parents the opportunity to see a activity. More often than not, they're activities that we would do in the classroom. And basically, why is this beneficial? And sticking along the Head Start rules. I never use food. And I also try to make it where you never have to leave to go out and buy anything. One, try not to leave your house to go to the store, but also like, let's not spend money on something that um, is perishable. So let's try to use what we have. So what we have today is we're going to watch a series, excuse me, we're going to watch a couple of videos from this series, but I want you to take a moment and put on the lens of your littles. Think about those kids in your classroom. Are you an infant toddler teacher? Are you preschool? Are you, where are you at? And think about those children because as we're watching these videos, most of them pretty much deal with threes, fours, and fives, but the whole purpose is for you guys to start thinking of how you can translate these activities into your space, into um, your working environments and how if you wanted to send these to your parents to help them out, how can you alter it to be developmentally appropriate for a two-year-old or a 10-month-old? So here's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to start by watching a video. Oh, my sound is cutting in and out. Oh, crumbs. Is it working now, friends? Hello. All right, it's working at this moment. I will just keep, I will be mindful of the chat. Thank you guys for telling me. I did not drop too much wisdom on you while, uh, while it was in and out. So um, let's go ahead and get started with the first video. Roll it, Karen. We are in week three of quarantine, and we've decided to venture outside into the backyard where we are going to be doing a little bit of science and a little bit of fine motor. So, one of my favorite things to do with our littles is having them cut the grass. I know that may seem super simple, but it's not only really good for fine motor, but it forces them to focus and concentrate, and it's a lot of fun and very relaxing. All you need is a little pair of scissors and a patch of grass, and just have them trim. Feel more zen already. All right, but here's the thing. As you were cutting and as you were exploring, you may find a bug. 
one of my favorite things in the whole world is bug exploration. And all you need is a little bit of mason jar and a stick to slowly pick up your new friend, place them in the jar, close it up tight, and explore. Be able to look, do drawings, have conversations, then go inside and look up what you found. Tons of science, tons of fine motor, and tons of fun. Alright guys, I'm going to enjoy my backyard. I will see you guys tomorrow. Make sure to wash your paws, be super kind, and toodles! All right, so that's kind of just an example to get started. I love that you guys are already jumping right in, like such an easy way to do simple explorations. Oh, it's Lynette. Hey, Lynette. So let's let's break this down by looking at the activity. So what subject areas are we teaching? Well, a couple. Let's start off with science. Now there's just exploring the environment in which you live in. Now there's little things, little discussions, little prompts through questioning that we can dive more into. So let's say you're outside in your yard. That could be a wonderful opportunity to talk about recycling. We are in the Midwest. So that means that there is clay, there is sand, and there is about five kinds of dirt out there. That is another really great way of maybe looking at different sediments, looking at how the land has been formed. And of course, my personal favorite, bug hunt. Because as you start digging, you will definitely find bugs and nothing will intrigue a child more than being able to look at bugs for hours. So making sure to bring out a mason jar, having a stick ready to slowly, if you don't want to pick it up with your hands, to place it in, and then be able to go inside, look up what you found, and talk about it. Talk about what is living in your environment. Now let's go ahead and break that into math for a moment. So you are now out in the yard. One way to extend this is the idea of what does it look like by if we were to cut, take all of the clippings and weigh that? Or take a ruler out and measure the tallest, tallest strand of grass we can find and the smallest strand of grass we can find. That's a really great way of having experiential learning. And of course, sensory and fine motor. We all know that our little paws are not super strong yet and writing is often very painful and so are scissor skills. One really great, great way to start strengthening those muscles, those fine little muscles, is by engaging in sensory play. And grass is a really wonderful place to do it. And I don't know about you, but there's a reason that Zen gardens are a thing. <laughs> and it is very calming. And it's also really, it's amazing how many hours can just go by. So the first poll is going to come up. And I want you to, again, like within the lens of your little what are some other fine motor ideas that we can do outside? Now think about your age group. Think about the environment that your kiddos may be living in and what are some additional fine motor that you can be offering and suggesting to parents? Writing with chalk, great answer. Lots of chalk, also you have literacy at that point. So play with the mud, oh goodness yes. Picking up leaves, which are still outside. Using tongs to pick up rocks. I love that. Just even simply like picking flowers, picking up sticks, cleaning your backyard. And again, these are all really great opportunities that you can talk about if you go out in the morning and that grass is wet, but it didn't rain the night before. That's an entirely different conversation. The one thing about our out yard, or excuse me, our outside that I love so much is the fact that all of these provocations the things that make us ask who, what, when, where, why, how, they're all outside and they are free. They're totally free. I'm going to take one of these answers and unpack it for a moment. The idea of um, exploring seeds, think about if you would then go into uh, separating them out. Make it even harder. Grab some tweezers and have them <laughs> completely separate that bird seed. Talk about a really great way to build those fine motor and also be able then to help our bird friends. And then you can have a whole conversation about what do animals need? What do we all need to live? Like, guys, you are so spectacular. These are great. And again, lots of painting on sidewalks. So let's move on to the next one because we got six of these bad boys. Oh, crumbs. Next video. Halfway through week four of quarantine. Let's do some science. 
Sink or float is a classic early ed science experiment, and it helps our littles get primed for taking on ideas later, such as force and destiny. I mean, dense. Super simple, what you'll do today is pick up objects all around the house that you will experiment with later and make a prediction sheet. Then at night at bath, conduct your experiments. Drop each of the objects into the water and record if it sinks or if it floats. You can help your littles by not only keeping them safe in the tub, but marking down what happens. And then post bath, do a wrap up. Talk about each of the objects, talk about what happened and any properties that they share. Super simple. Not only do you get a clean kid, but you got a lot of science too. So wash your paws, be incredibly kind, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Toodles! All righty. So sink or float. We all know this one, and we know this one well. It is a classic, um, especially because of the fact that it is good for littles of all ages. And we all know that Obviously, water can be a hazardous, so if we are doing this with toddlers, to one, stay by, but two, don't put a lot of water in. They, they don't need much. So let's break this down again just by subject areas. Well, nothing is better than doing a science experiment, and the scientific method is something that you can instill with littles super early. So talking about what an observation is, what a hypothesis is, and then going through. One of the best tools in our toolbox is the ability to ask questions. Through questioning, we develop higher order thinking. So those questions need to be open-ended. Those would allow the children to be able to recall, analyze, remember, um, evaluate, like everything that we want them to do to just develop these higher order concepts, we can do through simple questioning. So asking them with each of these pieces, what do you think is going to happen? Why do you think that? And then at the end, being able to talk about all of those common features. How come everything that was wood floated? How come everything, all those rocks we found outside, sank? So there's a lot of different um, components that are really great for the science aspect. Also, a lot of these kids, well, all of these kids will be later taking on much richer concepts. And by um, focusing on the idea of when you wrap up, well, Let's talk about things that are solid, liquid, gas, molecules, and molecules that are closer together, further apart. And also, if you've got a little fancy scale, you can weigh stuff. But let's pull over our poll for this one, because then we'll elaborate a little bit more. All right, so thinking of your littles, thinking about what they have at the house. What are some other materials that you can suggest to your parents to do sink or float? Let's put them in bath time. Let's put them in something that the parents are normally going to do anyway. So maybe they're outside playing, maybe they're in the bath, maybe, oh my gosh, you guys wrote so fast. Dice, keys, apples, markers, lots of different fruit. Yeah, toy cars, glass. And that's, you know what? I love the fact that you guys are pulling ideas from the previous video because yeah, let's put those 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 uh those sticks we found in sink or float. Let's try those those rocks out. Let's put the grass and the leaves in. And then again, you have the whole day outside and I, it wouldn't be today because it's too cold, but maybe tomorrow. Some cups, some spoons, utensils. Think about that. Putting a little bit of a pot of water on the floor while you cook and giving your kiddo different kinds of things and having them explore and play with. So when you're sending these out, when you're talking to your parents, think about these different kinds of suggestions because these are the things that super seem common sense to us, but our parents don't always know all these like really basic activities, so it's really great to try. I know I'm not currently ask, answering any questions. We're going to answer questions at the end, so if you have some, um, hold on to them. And let's move forward. Roll it, Karen. And welcome to week two of Quarantine with Rachel. Um, last week was um, interesting. And going into this week, it appears as if we're not going to be really going anywhere anytime soon. So let's start thinking about our environment and having our home life look a little bit more like their school life. So does that mean we would paint an entire wall of chalkboard paint? 
I mean, I would, but I can't because I rent, although I'm going to check that on my lease. Any hoosies. We are gonna start making a literacy rich environment. And yes, you can do that with books, but you can definitely do that with labels. If you've ever been in your child center, you've seen labels all over the place. And it's not because we don't know where we put things, we're very organized for your teachers. It's because labels help our littles with not only letter recognition, but letter sounds, words, and getting them to become active readers. On this part one of part two, you will be needing a notebook, something to write with, and your little. Now that we have our materials, we're going to go around the house and basically make an entire list of everything that we will be labeling tomorrow. Drawer, table, plant, chair, door, bathroom, stove, cat. Good luck with that. And that's pretty much it. You're going to take all of these lovely items that we've written down and tomorrow we will be making labels for them. And you can actually get started tonight with tomorrow's prep by getting your paper together for your labels. Totally use a note card. That's super easy. It's already cut for you. But if you want to throw in some fine motor skills and some scissor skills, you can make your own labels. Super simple. Just take a piece of printer paper, fold it in half, hamburger style, and fold each of those in. You'll have creases. Have your littles work on there fine motor by cutting these out. Not only is it a really great activity to work on those paws, but you're prepping yourself for tomorrow, which is huge. Speaking of tomorrow, I'll see you then. Until then, be super kind, wash your paws, and toodles. Previously on Quarantined with Rachel. Hi everybody. It is day nine of quarantine. We are on a two-part episode, and it's week two, and there's a whole lot of numbers in there. But today we're not talking about numbers, we're talking about labeling, because it's the part two of the part two. Yesterday, if you recall, we went around the house and we found all different things that we are going to label to encourage a literacy-rich environment. Well, today is the day that we put those fine motor skills to use. Last night, you had the opportunity to cut them out, so they should be all prepped and ready to go. So the first thing we're going to do is, if you recall from way back in the day, you might have had a sentence strip on your desk or you've seen them on the walls and they look a lot like this. They're super easy to make. All you have to do is take a marker and go deep, 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 all the dots all the way down. I absolutely love this because of the fact that this activity is super individualized to wherever your little may be. So let's start with the youngest of young and say that you have a non-writer, non-reader. No problem. You can do a couple of things. One, you can simply make the labels yourself, but then go through and explain each of the letters and each of the sounds to your little. Or you can do the dot method. If you've ever done connect the dots, and of course you've done connect the dots, because we all have, you do the same thing with the letters. You're going to make dots, indicating each one, and having your little one work on their fine motor skills by tracing. As they're doing that, you can also work on the letter sounds. T, table. Love it, right? Okay, let's move up a step. Let's say you have a writer, but not quite reader. No problem. You can simply go ahead and give them the label with the word above and have them copy it. Or you can sit next to them and do the exact same thing. Writing the first word, let's say cat. What letter makes that sound? Totally great conversation at that point for long and short vowels. You get the gist. Now let's say you have a writer and a reader and you're like, Rachel, I don't need this. You do because later on we're going to do an activity and this is going to be super crucial for your little to have these labels. So while this may not be completely developmentally challenging for them today, oh, trust me, friend, it will be. So labels are made. Now you gotta put them where they go. Here's the thing, don't put them at your eye level, put them at their eye level. Go ahead today, check out the Instagram feed because there'll be all of these fun activities that you can do to enhance this exploration. Um, hint, 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 circle the vowels. Underline the consonants. Action-packed fun for the whole family. Alrighty guys, get to work. I'm so excited for tomorrow because we're taking on a brand new topic. 
So until then, wash your paws, be extremely kind to each other, and I'll see you And toodles. Okay, let's move on. So this is probably one of my favorite videos that we've done um, because of the fact that one, we all know that not all of our classroom, or excuse me, that not all of our children have access to ample libraries, and especially with libraries being closed, we still want to be able to encourage having a literacy rich environment, but maybe it's not possible with hardbound books. So being able to utilize labels is a really great way to one, depending no matter where your child is, be able to um, provide it for them at their right time. And also as they become more and more comfortable with those label labels and sounds because they are like sponges and they will soak it up really fast, you can just keep changing them, adding more. So let's pull over this poll because it's probably my favorite. We got the best answers last time from this. How can we continue to develop emerging readers when they are at home? So we already talked about labels. We, what more can we do? Definitely reading to them. Reading them, reading to them every single day is the most important thing. Words on cereal boxes, that's the thing. We're, we live in literacy rich environments. Everything around us has labels. Everything around us has words. So being able to do letter cutouts, identifying letters in magazines, in all different print that comes to your home. His articles. You guys are so on top of it. I really love the fact that uh, Karen's going to share all these with you guys later so that you guys are able to be able to really find out and become inspired. Audiobooks. Yeah, guys, there's a lot of different things. I just love the fact that how much reading is coming up. If anything, any advice we can give to our parents is definitely read to them. Playing I Spy Games. Yeah, if you decided to, that when you come back from the grocery store to put out all of your food on the counter while it's drying from whatever you wiped it down with and say, let's find all the A's, let's find all the C's, let's find all the W's. That's a really great small game to play while, while you're all engaging at the house. Alrighty, we're just moving right along, friends. Oh, crumbs, not yet. Video time first. It's day 18 of quarantine. Let's talk about socks, baby. Children are concrete thinkers. So when teachers take on subjects like math, which is extremely abstract, we use manipulatives. And today, we're gonna be using socks. Not these, these are too dull. Socks. Socks can do a lot of things. You can do counting, pairing, and math equations. Also, you can play a lot of fun games. One of my favorite in particular is hide the sock. Always pick your least favorite sock, hide it somewhere in the house, and have your child find it. Super simple, lots of fun, should take a few hours. And also, if you play your cards right, half the laundry may get done for you. Alrighty guys, until tomorrow, wash your paws, be incredibly kind, and I'll see you then. Toodles! Alright, nothing like a good manipulative. So obviously this has a lot of math. There's different kinds of, you can do creating pairs, you can do one-to-one -one correspondence. If the kids are a little bit older, obviously you can utilize those socks for addition and subtraction, but you can also do sizes. Kids' socks are a lot smaller than adult socks. So what does it look like to put all the socks that you have from smallest to tallest or tallest to smallest? And when we come to playing hide the sock, it's not just a great way to, you know, entertain them for a while, but it's a lot of problem solving. There's a lot of critical thinking involved. And my favorite thing to help children with, executive function. So patience, turn taking, impulse control. And it's one of those games that you can make it as difficult as you need it to be for that kiddo. <laughs> and depending on how long your next Zoom call is. All right, let's pull over the poll. All right, so recognizing the fact that math is definitely one of those things that we want to make sure our littles are being um, keeping up with, 
and recognizing all of the fun materials that we have in our house, what are some additional math activities that they can do? Lots of patterns, lots of buttons. And buttons are also a really great place to do fine motor skills. Sorting the socks, think about that, folks. You got half your job already, uh, excuse me, half the laundry already done. Puppets, yes. Puppets are another great thing to do with socks, especially because I don't know about you, but I always have that one rando one. Making stuffed animals. If you guys, um, if your kid is old enough and you are able to do some sewing, that's a really great fine motor activity, especially with um, some buttons. Yeah, there's a lot of different stuff that we can do for additional math. Lining up sizes, number hunts, lots of sorting. And again, I love the fact that you guys are thinking about this through your lens, through your kiddos. Folding colors, I mean, excuse me, folding towels and sorting them. If you play your cards right, guys, the whole laundry might get done. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next video. Into month two of quarantine with a garden. If you can spare a square of paper towel, one or two dried beans, and a plastic sandwich bag, you are well on your way to a soup, or a stew, or a snack, but really just a plant. This super simple activity, your littles can do all of it. Go ahead, what you do is you wet a paper towel thoroughly, place it in the plastic bag so it is flat, and add one or two of those dried beans with about an inch and a half away from the bottom. Seal it up, but not all the way, and attach it to the window. Go ahead and pull out one of those fancy labels that you made way, way back in the day of week two, and label what it is. In this case, it's a bean. And you know what? Every single day track it. The best part about this is that while plants do take a really long time to grow, this activity, well, happens quite quickly. Within a few days, you're gonna see sprouts, you're gonna see roots, and for our littles that lack that executive function, it's really satisfying. You can go ahead and follow my Instagram where I'm gonna be tracking it via stories every single day, and I would love nothing more than you to send yours, and I can share your garden. So go ahead, get your garden ready, wash your paws, be incredibly kind. Again, toodles. Alrighty, friends. So first of all, I need to do a massive shout out. I saw in the attendee list that Darcy Fitzsimmons is here. And this is a Highland Park community classic for the... Um, Every room, every room did this. And I'm sure this is something that you probably have done in your room as soon as spring starts up. Um, it is far and away one of the most exciting ways to bring that much needed life into your classroom after the long winter, winter months. So there's a lot of different things, obviously, when we come down to uh, subject areas. There's math in regards of you can measure how long those roots get because believe it or not, they are substantial before you put them into a pot. You can uh, compare, contrast yours versus others. You can go ahead and in regards to science, that's botany. If you go through, the best part is those beans, they are big enough that the children are able to really see with the naked eye, no, no microscopes needed. If you don't have a, um, uh, magnifying glass it's okay because they're gonna be able to see and you can point out and if you are not a botanist that's just fine that's what the internet is for that's what books are for you can look up each of those parts um, I've had a couple people responding to this which has been really great because they were sending in their gardens and what they were doing it was awesome because they would plant a bunch of different kinds of seeds and see which ones would sprout first and then track it over over that week, over the next month. And um, it's a really great thing to do, especially because of the fact that a lot of parents right now and caregivers are getting ready to put their gardens in if they have space. So you might as well start them inside with your kids helping out. And again, all you need is um, just a few paper towels, some seeds, some beans, dried beans work the best, and some water. 
Alrighty, friends. Now, I know the poll is not up, but I really want to hear from you because a lot of people are talking about different things that they can do within this. Um, sorting is for sure, especially the fact if um, you can pull a bunch of different kinds of dried beans, having them sort that first, that's also math. You can use those as those math manipulatives that we were talking about. So when you think about doing this with your kiddos, think about um, one, where are they with their hands and their hand strength? Can you use tweezers? Can they use their um, just bare hands? What do you want to put them in? And also making sure that uh, you are following up. Again, think about that science journal we talked about earlier. When you spray those seeds and you put them in, what do you think is going to happen? Why? Well, that allows them to take all of their prior knowledge about how plants work and put it forward. Alrighty, friends. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, I love this idea of finding seeds and fruit with tweezers. Yes, that's great. Okay, I'm sorry, I totally get distracted in the chat. All right, let's keep going. It's day 10 of quarantine with Rachel, and today we rock. Music is a great teaching tool, and we're gonna be talking a little bit today about instruments. So you may be thinking, Oh no, Rachel, I don't have an instrument. You totally do have an instrument at home. You may not realize it though. They are called basically simple pots and pans. And this is a great activity for our littlest of littles to our biggest of bigs. We can all benefit from drumming. But I know what you're thinking right now. Please, oh please, do not give my child spoons and pots and pans. It will drive me bonkers. I would never do that to you. Guys, all you have to do is take a spoon, wrap an old dishcloth around, Secure it with a rubber band, and you would not believe how well this muffles the noise. That is totally tolerable. So we can do a couple of different things. You can say, can you hit the drum three times? One, two, three. Can you just do it with your right hand? One, two, three. Left, one, two, three. See, a lot of different vocabulary. We can say things like, can you hit that drum super fast? What about super slow? What about really hard? What about really soft? See, lots of different things that you can do, or you can just let them go to town and put on music in the background. Doesn't matter. The one thing I really love about drumming are the therapeutic qualities. When we all drum, no matter our age, it relieves stress, tension, and anxiety. Something that all of us may be feeling a little bit right now. The other thing it does though is for our littles who aren't able to verbalize what's going on, drumming is an incredible way for them to express themselves. So, get your spoons, get your cloth, get your pots and pans, and rock out. I will see you tomorrow for day 11. Toodles. All right, so interesting thing about this is one, let's talk about briefly that rubber bands are a choking hazard. So, um, no, you know your kiddo, you know if that's something that you should be concerned about. Uh, if you are concerned about, you can use a couple of different things. You can, one, duct tape some uh, towels, old rags onto uh, spoons. That works really well. You can also go ahead and sub out those wooden spoons for some spatula, or not spatula, you know, the rubber things. Spatulas, that's what they're called. Clearly, I'm a very avid, I'm an avid chef. Um, for spatulas, you can also, uh, instead of using pots and pans, even though pots and pans are really the best because they provide that, that uh, very satisfying reverberation in your hands, um, you can use piddle, pillows or anything else to uh, still muffin, muffle the noise and be safer. So with that out of the way, let's, oh, you could totally use socks or mittens. Exactly. Just like, Way to go, Marissa. Yeah, just like slide that on over. Alrighty, so let's break down some of these science areas. Well, the fact that drumming is completely open-ended. This is, this is a, a massive exploration that could last every single day. You never know, you might be creating a budding new musician. So with math, rhythm is counting. It's natural, it's intuitive, and it's there. So you can provide prompts to those little. So if you wanted to suggest this activity to your folks at home, you can provide questions for them. Provide, um, model some of those, those prompts that they should give their little. Like, can you count the drum 10 times? 
can you, uh, if they're older and they're doing math, if I have three and I add two, can you hit the drum that many it equals? So simple addition, subtraction. Now, this is where it gets lots of fun, I think. So for literacy, one, totally provide vocabulary. What does it look like if you hit that drum, or excuse me, what does it sound like if you hit that drum super fast? If you hit that drum super slow? If that drum was really happy, how would it sound? If it was super sad, how would it sound? Inserting some social emotional is always, it's a great place to do it through telling that story. You could also, I don't know about you guys, but Foley artists are really cool. They're the people who make all those fun sound effects. Well, do that with the drum. Tell a story. We're going on a bear hunt and we have to run. And then obviously hit the drum really fast. Bing, 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 bing. We're going to sleep. How would that sound? Bop, bop, bop. So think about a really great way of storytelling with music. And the main reason I wanted to do this activity and put it out there is really because of the fact that drums are super beneficial. There's drum therapy. Like it's, especially for our kiddos who are not able to talk and verbalize how they're feeling, being able to just get that adrenaline pumping is huge. Being able to just focus on one thing and have cause and effect is massive. I love how much you guys are taking to this idea. Definitely think about those prompts that you can give to those parents to ensure that um, they don't just simply give their kids the spoons and give their kids the pots and pans, but provide some questions that are really going to make it a very rich activity. All right. We are going to move on to our last video, and then we will do some Q&A. and uh, quarantine, let's talk about screen time. Screen time is inevitable, but there are a few things that we can do to make the most out of it. And don't tell your kids, but they're academic. And all it involves is a few simple questions. When they sit down to watch their video, before it even gets started, ask them, how did you pick it? And what do you think will happen? Halfway through their watching, have them pause and tell you what has happened so far and ask them what they think will happen next. And when the video is complete, all you have to do is have them tell you the plot of the story, have them tell you their favorite character and why, and if they could change one thing, what would they change? These questions seem super simple and they are, but they help with sequencing as well as critical thinking, both components of science and literacy. So go ahead. Hand them the screens. Make sure they wash their paws. They're super kind. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Toodles! All right. So again, I feel like I have to like preface something just because of out of doing this before. Some of the things popped up were um, I never wanted to like make it seem that I want you to give your kiddo a screen. How this happened was about two weeks into quarantine, all of these articles came out about people being concerned that their child was basically like they, they were, they already reached their limit and their go-to was giving their kiddo these screens. And that, that then they started having all these like second thoughts of like maybe screen time is bad and yada, yada, yada. So it was this idea of like, okay, well, let's, let's have a serious talk about screen time because if you think it's not going to happen, you're totally wrong. Like, if they're in your house, there's a very good chance that that kiddo is going to be looking at a screen. So let me just say that first. I'm not just saying like, yeah, hand them that screen. They'll be just fine. Uh, no, I really want to break down these really great ways of utilizing a screen that is not only beneficial um, for them, but also makes it a very different viewing experience, having them watch it critically as opposed to just consuming. So let's talk about screen time for a moment when it comes to the subject areas. If you think of a story in a book, similar to that of like a story of a television show or a movie, well, think about how you would ask those questions. If you were doing a read aloud, all of those moments that you would pause and ask, what do you think is gonna happen next? Or if you're working on sequencing, so what has happened so far in our story? Asking them to recall, asking them to think critically about 
if it's something that they haven't seen, what do you think will happen? Again, all of these really great higher order questioning comes in. Asking them when they're done, so what happened? What would you have changed? What do you think if, who was your favorite character? Why? Was there anything you didn't like? Having them really think about what they just viewed with a, a different lens makes the whatever hour, hour and a half, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, even more impactful. So when you're doing this, and again, like I'm just going to use an example like Frozen because that seems like a classic. So as you're going, if you, they've seen it probably a billion times, you've seen it probably a billion times too. Pause it and be like, okay, so what happened? Have them tell you and be like, okay, what if, if you can remember all those fun choose your own adventures, uh, what would happen if Olaf melted? That kind of got dark. Okay, maybe not that. But what happens if Anna blank, 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 blank. Like provide different, different outcomes and let your child think about it. Because one, it may spark some seriously cool fan fiction. But also, it just um, makes it very different with how they view it. So I want you guys to take a moment and think about what are some questions that we can ask while we are viewing something that they have seen before, something that they're very familiar with. Like, is there any kind of prompts, any questionings that we can suggest to our parents who maybe they watch a movie together as a family? And you guys can throw these in the chat. I'm so sorry there's uh, no poll for this one. Next time we do this, Karen, we'll make a poll for it. Yeah, totally, Lynette. Why do they do that? Asking them to think about the motivation. You can also throw in some social emotional. How do you think Olaf would feel if he melted? What was your favorite part of the movie? Totally, Paula. How does that make you feel? I'll... And again, I love the fact that all of these answers have, excuse me, all of these questions have open-ended answers because that, again, is our entire point of this. What would you change? Now, I'm going to challenge you guys on something. So let's say there is no sequel, and I know with any Disney movie that seems utterly impossible, but let's say there's not a second one. Let's say they really, really like a I'm trying to, like, what's in that? I don't know, another Disney movie without a sequel. They really like this one movie. Well, you can ask them, what do you think happened after it ended? Now, are those kids older? Are they able to do some writing? Or are you able to help out with story dictation? You can take the story, and even though it's in its uh, virtual format, what does it mean for that second chapter? That second chapter that's not yet been pixelated. Those kids can draw what they think will happen next. Those kids can draw the second part of that story. You can make a book about Frozen 3. What are all the names of the characters? Oh, that's such a great idea. Having them really think about every single person, all of those fine details, because again, when we think about um, all of those different literacy components, however we would treat a book during rec time is very similar to how we would treat our kiddos while they watch these movies. How do they make you feel? Happy, sad? What's the setting? And again, like these are really great words. These are words that you would utilize in the book. Utilize them when it comes to on screen. Oh, and even for sure, acting out your favorite part. So guys, when you, um, if you decide to share any of these or just take these ideas and send them out in your newsletter, um, Darcy mentioned earlier that they're actually dropping off bean supplies to those parents of those kids, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. Um, next week, whatever you guys decide to do, I just highly suggest that you focus um, on providing really, really basic instructions and including questions with those. Um, the power of questioning cannot go, I cannot state it enough. It is sincerely something that a lot of parents don't know about and it is next to reading and next to talking to our kiddos it's some of the best things that we can do to really encourage not just higher order thinking but um having them just think 
uh, critically about what they are doing and developing that skill. So we have 15 minutes. With that being said, if you guys could start putting questions within this chat, that would be phenomenal. Um, I'm also going to ask you guys for a prompt. Is there an activity that you guys do that you love that you just think is phenomenal? Because I'm currently made 30 of these. And it's not that I'm running low on ideas, but I feel like I'm not, uh, you guys are the best well to draw from. And with that being said, if you have an activity that you just think is the bee's knees, that you cannot, you, you cannot wait to do it every single year, throw that in the chat too. All right, friends. Do we have permission? Yes, you totally have permission to share these videos with your family. Um, we are going to do uh, two more of these. There's a separate quarantine with Rachel, or excuse me, home with Rachel version two that will be out, I think next week, is it? And then uh, version two, or excuse me, version three the following week. Color mixing, ooh. You guys are so good, I'm gonna have to take a screen grab of these. Oh yes, so Karen's like the next two Fridays. So if you really enjoyed doing, um, if you really enjoyed these, if you took out some ideas that you can definitely pass on to your kid, or excuse me, pass on to your families. Um, is there different versions for two and three? So Esther, how this goes is the next for version two, there's there's six different videos, and version three, there's another six different videos. So we're just gonna keep going, but you can also always find them on my Instagram or my Facebook. Um, and feel free to share them through there. Or also, you know, talk about, I really miss being in the classroom. So you can sincerely just talk about anything you want to do and how you do this with your kiddos. Um, making slime, making bubbles. Guys, these are really great ideas. All right, so do I have any additional questions? Because we flew through this. Sensory bin activities. I love this optimism of actually being able to go out for a walk now. Clearly, we all know it is 20 degrees outside. I'm making oobleck. So this is the fun thing that's, um, we do have a couple videos coming up that um, involve sensory. And it's been really interesting to be able to look at how to make sensory material without, <laughs> without having, one, trying to use food, or two, uh, things that you live within your, excuse me, things that happen within your home. So check out for those. It's been very, very fun. Oh, so Karen's putting up right now that um that the other screenings, or excuse me, other webinars are full, but there is a wait list. So please, by all means, like sign up for those. We unpack some additional, every single one has additional literacy and math and science and always fun experiments. So tie-dye listening walks guys these are really great if you don't have any questions and i'm going to go into a hardcore mini keynote for the next two seconds which i don't think you do and if they come up they'll pop up so i just want to take a second and say one what you guys are doing is incredible there are so many kiddos who miss you in oh, dearly um the idea that them not being able to see you every day is really heartbreaking. I live above a five-year-old who asks me every single day um, why he can't see his teacher. And he doesn't necessarily mention his friends either. He talks about his teacher. And you guys are absolutely, it warms my heart dearly to be able to connect with you. Uh, I do find it fascinating that it took a pandemic for us to go from being viewed as babysitters to the essential workers that we actually are. And I really want you to take this opportunity because of the fact of all of those hash, or excuse me, all of those hashtags that were always on the fringe, the things like thank a teacher, or, pay a teacher more. Are those trending hashtags every single day? I don't know about you, but I finally feel like I've actually been invited to the adults table and somebody asked my opinion and people are actually listening. So I'm sure like you guys, you're very frustrated with certain things, be it ratios, be it pay, be it quality. 
be it access, be it any of these things, I'm sure you there's something that you would change about this field or even just how you're seen. I highly recommend taking this opportunity, especially because it's an election year and every single politician is listening closer to their constituents. Take this opportunity, take this weekend, take the fact that it is very, very cold outside and write a very short little email or put it up on social or just put it out there. Tag, if you're in Illinois, tag Dick Durbin, tag uh, Tammy Duckworth, let them know. But really put out there that um, when things become familiar, they're not going to be normal. We don't want it to be normal. Normal means that you're paid under $12 and you're a babysitter. When things become familiar, don't let that be one of them. Let's end this pandemic in a way that educators are where we should be in regards to being essential and viewed that way, not that we're just playing. So please, if you have time this weekend, write a little bit of an email. If you are going to send these ideas to your parents and please, please help them out. They did not go to school for this. And while they love their children and they are their child's first and best teacher, you probably got some student debt, my friend. You went to school for this. You know it's up. Share your knowledge. Because that's one thing that we do very well. We're really great teachers, and not just to our kiddos, but their parents. So when you share these activities to them, at the same time, maybe let them know what they can do to support you and support our community. So reaching out and just saying like, hey, here's some things to do this week, thinking about you. Sink or swim, or sorry, float or sink, cutting the grass outside, yada, yada, yada. By the way, um, if you could just let somebody know like to support and advocate for preschool teachers and early childhood educators as a whole, that would be really great. So be an advocate. You have it in you. Uh, it's often funny to think, I don't know about you, but I never thought I was an advocate when your like, clothes are covered in paint and your hair is messed up and, and you talk to children all day. But we are actually the best advocates for ourselves. So take this opportunity and um, do that. So um, going back through some questions because I see some questions now. Uh, yes. Videos are on YouTube. There is an entire entire series that just says Quarantine with Rachel. Um, let me put right now in the chat my name because, you know, all the vowels makes it really difficult. G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. -N -N -I. Oh, crumbs. Thank you so much, Karen. Or, you know, Karen can just put that up and crush it because she's an all-star. So, yeah, hit me up. Um, Instagram and doesn't really, I mean, I put the videos up. But they're super long, and Instagram has that cutoff of 60 seconds. So by all means, like, uh, it, you can't really share off of it. But definitely via Facebook, definitely Twitter. And if you just type my name into YouTube, all uh, those videos would be there. Again, this is, like, my way of just trying to make something better. So please, if it resonated with you, like, share it with your folks. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for attending this. I have to tell you right now that seeing these really great comments just, I mean, sometimes you don't want to make a video and seeing comments like this really encourages it. So please, by all means, share these and make sure to write your letter. Make sure to get it out there. There's a lot of great organizations, NACI and CCA, Child Care Aware, are trying to do things around just ensuring that once everybody is back to work, that we're in a very different place via our profession. So please check them out, hit them up, 